Well, good afternoon, everybody. I just, uh, I want to pray some more. Father, we bring our hearts, our minds, we, we think of you, Jesus, how you, you repeated to us that great command that we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And we know, Lord, um, that we want to do that. But we need you to work that in us and through us. So Jesus, all, all we can do is we, we've praised you. We've poured out our hearts before you. And Jesus, now we want to open up our hearts and our minds to receive something from your word. You're a faithful God, faithful to every promise. So come and, and speak to us as men, as leaders, as sons, as sheep. We need to hear it from you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, indeed. Hey, open up your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 19. Uh, I want to start off our conference by speaking to you about a subject that's very near to my own heart. It's about when God does something genuinely great, genuinely remarkable. Uh, like many of you, I'm fascinated by the history of Christianity to, to see not only what God has done in biblical times, but what God has done after that and even in our own age. And, and one area of special interest to me and to many of you are, are these seasons of, I, I don't know exactly what you'd call them. Sometimes we say revival. Sometimes we say spiritual awakening. Uh, it, it, it's simply a time of remarkable spiritual advance where it seems that God's kingdom advances forward and, and takes a lot of ground in a hurry. Now, I think of what they call the first great awakening in the 18th century. I mean, when you got a hundred year prayer meeting in a little German village called Herrenhut, that's, that's God moving, isn't it? Now, I mean that literally, a hundred year prayer meeting, 24 hours a day for a hundred years straight, there was a prayer meeting. Uh, you have Wesley and Whitfield and David Brainerd and, and these men who just impacted cultures and societies, made, made a huge impact. And then not long after that, also at the end of the 18th century, you have the Second Great Awakening with, with Jonathan Edwards and James McGrady and the beginning of these great uh, frontier camp meeting revivals and works here in the United States. And, and you could just go on and on. You can just sort of tick it off through the centuries. You can talk about the great things that God did through men like Darby and Mueller and Booth and Moody and Spurgeon and Murray and Roberts and people and places, just, just these seasons of great, great advance. Yet, yet I really think that we don't have to neglect God's word when we look at these seasons, these times of great advance. One of the best, best examples of a great outpouring of the Spirit of God is found for us on the pages of our own Bible, and you'll find it in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verse 20, sort of summarizes one of the most compelling works of the Lord that you're going to find in all of the New Testament. It's what God was doing, not just in the city of Ephesus, but the biblical text takes pains to point out that it's in the whole region of Ephesus, which was a big region. Look at it, Acts chapter 19, verse 20. What does it say? It says, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Now you just got to understand what that means. It's not just saying that they, they taught a bunch of Bible studies, although, believe me, that was part of it. But when the word of the Lord grows mightily and prevails, it means that lives are radically changed for the glory of Jesus Christ. It means that you have people, multitudes of people, who meet God in his word. Which, by the way, isn't this what we're about when we come and we preach the word and we study it for ourselves and we present it to our people? It's not about just the, the transmission of information. Though, let's face it, that's an aspect of it. But what we're really doing is providing a meeting place. God is faithful to meet people in his word. And that's what we want to pour out before them. You have people being transformed by the renewing of their minds. And make no mistake what that means. 
When people are transformed by the renewing of their minds, we're not just talking about they start attending church as if that's what it's all about. Although, look, that's a very important thing. We'd all agree. When you have people whose lives are transformed by the renewing of their minds, men stop beating their wives. Neglected children now have a father in the home who loves them and cares about them. That that man is no longer given over to drunkenness and spending his money on every kind of immorality and stupidity that comes along. You have genuine life and culture and community transformation because the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. You have lives that become more honoring to God. You have people who become stronger against temptation. You have people affecting the lives of the people around them. You have a fulfillment of what Jesus spoke about in John chapter 9, or excuse me, John chapter 8, where he said, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. That's sort of all bound up in that beautiful phrase there in Acts chapter 19, verse 20. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Now, when we take a look at this great work that God did in Ephesus, I'm going to point out four things that characterize that work. I don't mean to imply that these were the only four things going on in that work at Ephesus, but they're just four things that stick out in my own mind, in my own look at the text. It's not an exhaustive list, but I think it's a meaningful one. Let's just say that these four things happen when there's a season where God's work advances quickly. This is why I want to try to bring some clarity to you, gentlemen. I want you to understand that in these seasons of a remarkable work of God, you're not just talking about a period of spiritual excitement. You're just talking about turning up the heat or the amperage a little bit. It's far deeper than that. It's far more significant than that. So what are the four things I see here in the text? Well, I'll just click them off for you, and then we'll make our way through these verses in Acts chapter 19, and we'll take a look at them. So here's the four. First of all, there was a true dedication to teaching God's word. Secondly, there were unusual miracles, unusual examples of the power of God going on among them. Number three, there was the reality of the spiritual battle, spiritual warfare right in front of them. And number four, there was radical discipleship demonstrated by renunciation. So let's just take a look at those point by point. First of all, start at Acts chapter 19, beginning at verse eight, it says this. And he went to the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years. Here's the great phrase. So that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus both Jews and Greeks. That is a remarkable statement. Let's understand what was happening here in the city of Ephesus. I speak to you as men who know something of the word of God. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then, you know, read up on it, do a little research for yourself. But I don't have to tell you what an important, what a pivotal city Ephesus was in the ancient world. And you also know, because you know something from the book of Acts, how important Ephesus was in Paul's mind, that this was a strategic place for him, that on a second missionary journey, he wanted to go down to Ephesus, but the Holy Spirit forbade him and instead sent him northwest up through to Europe. But he made a special point on the end part of his second missionary journey to visit Ephesus. For some reason, Ephesus was on Paul's heart. It was on his mind. It was sort of a strategic place to him. He said, there needs to be a thriving Christian work going on in Ephesus. So on his second missionary journey, he spends just a few days there because he's in a hurry to get back to Jerusalem and then to Antioch, his home church. But on his third missionary journey, as far as Luke the historian wants us to consider, it's almost as if that third missionary journey begins in Ephesus. Right away, Paul's in Ephesus and doing a great work there. And at the beginning of Acts chapter 19, he's talking to people about the Holy Spirit, isn't he? 
Matter of fact, he's guiding people into a deeper, more full experience of who Jesus is and who the Holy Spirit is. And he's guiding them into that experience. But, but after that experience with this small group of people that were there in Ephesus, what does Paul do? He does his familiar thing. He goes into the synagogue and he starts preaching and teaching. And the synagogue was a brilliant place for Paul to begin any of his work. The synagogue was perfect. Because there, not only could he speak to the Jews who already had a connection to the things of the Old Testament, to the things of the Messiah, their hearts were already prepared and plowed, so to speak, but he could also speak to the God-fearing Gentiles who attended the synagogue. It was a perfect place for him to start. So as was his custom on just about any city that he visited in the Roman Empire, the first place he went was the synagogue. And he took that custom of the courtesy of the synagogue where they would invite an esteemed visitor to come and speak. And Paul said, well, I'm happy to speak to you this morning or afternoon, or whenever it was that they had their services. And Paul spoke to them, and he preached Jesus. And as you see right there in the text, it says, verse 8, that he went to the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months. That's a pretty good run. <laughs> week after week, Paul didn't get kicked out of the synagogue for three whole months. He had this extended time of preaching and teaching and opening up the scriptures. But eventually, the influence of the Jewish leaders there at the synagogue and if you look at the book of Acts, you'll find that more often than not, those uh, Jewish leaders of the synagogues who rejected Paul, they were motivated by envy. They didn't like what he was doing. They didn't like that he was being successful in reaching not only people to reach them and guide them to Jesus as the Messiah, but that he was actually reaching the God-fearing Gentiles as well. So what did they do? They kicked him out. They drove him out of the synagogue. Now, what did Paul do? Did he scratch Ephesus off of his list? Did he say, well, forget it. God must want me to go somewhere else. No, he said, I'm going to keep preaching in Ephesus. I'm going to look for a place to do it. He looked around and he fall, saw a school uh, run by a guy named Tyrannus. That guy must have been a tough teacher to get that name Tyrannus. <laughs> this man who ran a school named Tyrannus. And he said, I'll rent your school. I'll use it as a teaching hall. And it says there, remarkably so, it says, you saw it there. And this continued for two years. Paul taught daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now, I find it fascinating that there's one ancient, though not necessarily inspired, it's not inspired writing, but it's an ancient writing that says that Paul held the meetings at the school of Tyrannus from about 11 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. This was sort of their siesta time in the Ephesian culture, in that part of Asia. They would take off in the hot and humid afternoon between 11 and 4. They wouldn't do their business. And Paul said, well, if you're not going to operate the school during those hours, I'll teach during those hours. Let's do it. And apparently Tyrannus or whoever it was who was in charge of running the school, he said, okay, great. Between 11 and 4, it's yours. Paul taught from 11 to 4. Now do the math in your mind. How many hours is that? That's five hours. Now look, that, that's a long time, isn't it? I don't know if Paul could teach five hours a day every day. So let's say he only taught three hours a day every day. Daily he did it. You know what that means in the, the Jewish context that Paul came from? That means for six days a week, he taught three hours a day for more than two years in the school of Tyrannus. Vacation, very little. They take occasional breaks, right? Jewish culture, they'd have feast time and such as that. But pretty much for two years straight, six days a week, let's conservatively say three hours a day, Paul taught them the word of God. You do the math, make the calculations, you're conservatively speaking of something like 2,000 hours of teaching that Paul did there in Ephesus. Now you do the math in your own mind and think about it. What possibly could Paul teach in the school of Tyrannus for 2,000 hours to the Ephesian people, to all of those who dwelt in Asia for that time period? I'm convinced, I know, look, you, you men are smart enough to know when, when somebody's making a, a, a summation, what, what should I say, he's speculating a little bit on the text of scripture, not what the scripture says itself, but does anybody have any doubt that, that for 2,000 hours, Paul could do nothing else but just go verse by verse through books of the Bible? What else is he going to talk about for 2,000 hours? Well, I mean, really, I mean, this is what he would do. I'm not saying he never did occasional topicals on things. Of course he did. <laughs> what else would he have? Wouldn't he start at Genesis and say, open up your scrolls to Genesis chapter 1? <laughs> 
And he would say, here we go. Let's go through it and let's see how it speaks to us and what it says and, and how it shows us Jesus and how it shows. I'm just convinced this is what, what else would he do for 2,000 hours? Uh, this is what I want you to know. And this is the very important point. Paul had an incredible dedication to teaching in Ephesus and the whole region, because it says the whole region of Asia, Asia Minor there was reached with the word of God. And it was because Paul was so committed to teaching. Matter of fact, you could say this, Paul was living out what he later described in Ephesians chapter four, correct? In Ephesians chapter four, where Paul says that God gave these gifted offices to the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's exactly what he was doing in the school of Tyrannus. And what was the fruit of it? The whole region was reached for the glory of Jesus Christ. I'll read the words to you. This continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Does anybody think that all of those people were coming to the school of Tyrannus? I don't think so. But the people who were taught there at the school of Tyrannus went out and influenced the whole region for the glory of Jesus Christ. This was a true period of advance for the work of God. Listen, this is what I want you to get at, is that if you're looking for a season of great advance of God's work, you better found it thoroughly in good Bible teaching. Does anybody think Paul was doing anything else? This is what he was doing in Ephesus, pouring into them the word of God, reasoning, teaching for hundreds upon hundreds of hours there, investing his life, his heart into teaching them. So should we. We should be that dedicated to the word of God. Now, secondly, look at the second aspect. This is the aspect of the unusual miracles that were happening in Ephesus. Here we look at verse 11. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and evil spirits went out of them. I find this remarkable, the phrasing that Luke uses here in verse 11. Did you catch that? Unusual miracles. I don't know what normal miracles are, but, but these were unusual ones. And they were sort of weird. They were weird miracles, so much so that handkerchiefs or aprons, literally a sweat bands, they used the sweat cloths, you know, it's just sweaty rags that Paul used while he was working there in Ephesus. Because do I need to remind you that Paul was also working a regular job? And God bless all you bivocational pastors. You're stepping there in the footsteps of the apostle Paul, who worked a regular job, and when everybody else was off on siesta in the middle of the day, he hustled down to the school of Tyrannus, and he worked very diligently there, laboring in the word of God. And when siesta time was over, he went back to work at his job of leather working or tent making, whatever you want to call it. Providing, as he says later on in Acts chapter 20, not only for his own needs, but for the needs of those associated with him as well. He provided for the needs of others. But in the midst of all that, a man got sweaty. He worked hard. And they would take these sweat cloths or aprons or whatever exactly it is that you want to call them, and they would bring them to other people and lay them upon and people would get healed. And this is so strange. Isn't this strange to us? It's strange to me. I can imagine it happening at first quite by accident. Maybe somebody who was in need of healing took a handkerchief from Paul in sort of a superstitious manner. And they're superstitious people, are there not? And they think, well, this can work. This would be effective. And yet, nevertheless, they, they use faith, true faith in the living God, maybe just sort of springboarded by something sort of superstitious. And God in his grace, God in his mercy honored it. I, I think that's wonderful of the Lord to do that. And I can't explain why, but sometimes he does. Do you remember when that woman who had the issue of blood reached out and touched the hem of Jesus's garment? Honestly, in sort of an attached way, wouldn't you say that was sort of a superstitious thing to do? Would anybody in this room counsel somebody to do such a thing? No, it sounds sort of weird, you know, ritualistic, you know, weird Roman Catholic kind of relic practices kind of stuff. No, we'd never say anybody to do that. But God in his grace, God in his condescension to us, he just says, okay, look, I, I know you're messed up, but I'm going to bless you thus far, and I'll steer you then in the right direction. Sometimes God will stoop down to meet us even in our air. That never justifies our air. That never means we should guide a person in there, but sometimes God will just do that. 
But please notice that verse 11 says that God will work, that God worked unusual miracles. Now, these were unusual ones. God worked them, though, by the hands of Paul. All I can say is it just seems that God relishes doing things in unusual ways. Just to sort of mix things up, just to sort of blow things mind. And I, I need to be careful here. Because there is a current that runs through the Christian mind at large. And can I just say this? This is a bad current in the Christian world. That somehow has the idea that the more bizarre something is, the more it must be from the Lord. Do you understand what I'm talking about? That is a bad thing in the body of Christ. And it's an attitude that you'll find and you'll have to reckon with as a pastor or leader in your congregation sometimes. But, but that's sort of the attitude. And I think you understand what I'm talking about. It's that mentality that the stranger it is, well, the more it must be from the Lord. No, no. We understand that sometimes God will do things that to us seem strange. We recognize that. But, but we don't go to some extreme by thinking that just because something is strange, that it therefore must be of the Lord. There's a lot of weird stuff that has as its only justification is the strangeness of it. But this was entirely of a different order. We have to accept, though, that when God is moving, look, there's just going to be some unusual things that happen. But friends, what I like most are the unusual miracles that God does connected with real life transformation. That's what gets me the most excited. And you've got testimonies of that in your own life, in the lives of your congregations. You, you can also find them in the pages of history. Have you, read, have you read about these great seasons of God's work and heard about the amazing things that God has done with real life transformation? Unusual miracles, as Luke might call them. I like hearing about the coal miners during the Welsh revival in the early part of the 20th century. You've heard this story, haven't you? Well, maybe there's a few of you haven't. I'll just say it again, that, that, that during this great outpouring of the Spirit that happened in Wales, if you went excited and did any kind of objective measurement, crime statistics, drunkenness, uh, uh, children born to unwed mothers, on and on, all of those social indicators were dramatically improved in the direction of righteousness and godliness. Saloons were shut down, courts were closed for lack of business, jails were emptied, so on. It was a remarkable time of just cold Cultural and, and, uh, and community-wide transformation, except, except that for a season, production went down in the coal mines. You might say, why would revival cause production to go down in the coal mines? Were, were men neglecting their work because of the... No, it wasn't that at all. Men were doing their work. It's this, and this was, this was actually the problem. It's that they used the, these small horses, these ponies, to drag the coal carts out of the, the coal mines, you know, laden with coal, and they drive these animals, and they give them to drag the coal out of the coal mines. You can only imagine what a Welsh coal miner, how profanely he would swear at these ponies to get the work going and to drive the coal out. Well, the, literally, these Welsh coal miners came to Christ, were so transformed, that they couldn't swear anymore to the coal, and the ponies couldn't understand them when they told them to get, get the stuff out. <laughs> and for a season, it was only for a season, production went down because the ponies couldn't understand the newly purified speech of those Welsh coal miners. It took them a little while. They learned the, they learned the language of the people of God, and production came back up. But this kind of thing happens again and again. It, it happens in another great story. Is that, uh, during the same season of revival at a shipyard where, where, you know, men, you know how working men are. You know yourselves. You know men steal tools off the job. They do it all the time. Well, so many men at these shipyards were getting saved and just repentance and genuinely a change of life, a transformation of life, that they started bringing the tools back to the shipyard. Well, it was so much that the management couldn't handle it. They had no place to store all the tools, so they actually had to put up signs, please don't bring back any more tools, just keep them. <laughs> Look, these, would you not call these unusual miracles? In my mind, they're unusual miracles of the best kind. Listen, I just heard Saturday, there's a brother here, Craig Lindquist from Calvary Chapel in Tebe, Uganda. He shared about the great work that God's doing there. He shared about how the ground that once was a brutal killing field 
under Idi Amin, the terrible dictator of Uganda. It was once a killing field. Then it became a garbage dump and a place of, of brutal crime. And then now that same ground is a church and a school. That's an unusual miracle, I think. All that to say this, just as much as we should expect to see a true dedication to the word of God during such a season of outpouring, we should also expect to see evidence of unusual power and blessing. And that's exactly what they were seeing in Ephesus. But there is a third aspect to it. And this one is, well, it's funny, actually. Verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> then the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, was it leaped on them, leaped, leapt? He jumped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Wasn't this something? Now please, you gotta put it all into context. This is a season where the word of God, the power of God, the transforming work of God is being distributed not only there in Ephesus, but all throughout the region of Asia Minor. God is doing something deep and powerful. And in the midst of that, there is a renewed interest or, or the phenomenon of spiritual warfare and confrontation. What do you have? Well, you have this case of some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists. You know that in those days, there were Jewish exorcists as well. You can go back and look at their writings. And they had all this elaborate uh, folder, all these elaborate ceremonies for how to cast out demons. It's very interesting to read some of these because you see what a contrast there is between the power of Jesus and the vain ceremonies of these Jewish exorcists. For example, the Jewish exorcist held that, that it was an absolute must that if you're going to cast a demon out of somebody, and again, we know this from their ancient writings, we knew that it was a must that if you were to cast a demon out of somebody, you had to get the demon to tell you its name. So that, that was the first key for the Jewish exorcist. Get the demon to tell you its name. Therefore, they believed that the ultimate strategy or the ultimate trick, maybe I could say, of a demon inhabiting a person was to cause that person to become mute. If the demon caused the person to become mute, then you were powerless because you couldn't get the demon to tell you the name. What did Jesus do when he cast it? He cast demons out of mute people all the time. No problem, person's possessed with a demon, they're mute, bam, you're out. And they had all these elaborate customs and strategies. Jesus just blew all of that out of the water. He didn't follow ceremonies. He didn't follow st strategies in a human sense, as if you're following a recipe in a cookbook. He just used the power of God, connected to the spirit of the living God. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And that's exactly what these Jewish exorcists did not have. So in verse 13, it says that they came and they said, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now, this is significant, isn't it? They thought that they could get somewhere doing the work of God, combating the works of darkness by being tangentially connected to God. I'm not connected to God, but, but I'll claim some connection to Paul who's connected to God. And friends, you know very well that there's people in the ministry who make the same error. Let me speak to you very frankly. We, we look at these Jewish exorcists, and especially because they got beat up and their clothes ripped off and they had to run out of the house naked. We look at them and laugh, and I think Luke expected us to laugh a little bit when he wrote this. But it's not funny that many pastors, that many leaders, that it could be some of the said of them, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but I don't know you. Now I'm not trying to say for a moment that it's our goal to give ourselves a name among the demons. But I think you get the principle I'm driving at. 
We have to deal with God directly. Man, you've been given a tremendous gift, a tremendous gift. You're here at this conference because at least in some fashion, I may not know exactly how, but in some fashion, you are connected or you want to be connected to this family, to this association, this fellowship that we call Calvary Chapel. And you have to admit, God's done some pretty remarkable things in this last generation through this fellowship, through this association, whatever it exactly it is you want to call it. But here's the problem. When you join yourself, when you want to be attached to some kind of association or fellowship or movement, whatever you want to call it, the danger is, is you put confidence in your attachment instead of in Jesus Christ directly. And man, I'm happy that you're part of, of this wonderful family, of this association. It's a great thing, isn't it? Don't we enjoy it? Don't we love it? Don't we just, just revel in it? We do. But that shouldn't make any one of us be excused for the error of failing to deal with Jesus directly, with pursuing him and following hard after him. I don't know exactly why you're here. I hope that you're here to seek the Lord. I hope that you're here prayed up and ready to hear from God and ready to deal with what he says to your heart. I hope you're here ready for God to speak something unexpected to you. And I'm not talking about unexpected in the sense of some future declaration of something you didn't know, but unexpected about your own heart. I hope you're open to the idea that maybe you came here thinking that everything was okay. But God wants to shine a spotlight of his Holy Spirit in love, in grace, but maybe with a touch of firmness upon some area of your soul and say, let's get this right with me. You, you may be totally unaware of it as you sit here right now and hear these words. You might say, well, I'm glad he's saying this to somebody else here. I hope you're open to the spirit of Jesus dealing with you directly here during this conference. Doesn't he have the right to? Doesn't Jesus have every right to guide us and correct us to be a faithful shepherd to us with both a rod and staff? Yes, Lord Jesus, you do. You have every right. Lord, we don't want in any way to be like these sons of Siva who had no direct dealing with the God that they pretended to serve. Just as it said there in verse 15, the evil spirit wasn't impressed at all. The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But, but who are you? And then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them. But because unless you deal directly with Jesus, there is no power over those things. Oh, I know. There, there's a facade of it. There's, there's an association of it. But men, don't sell yourself short. I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're together as a family. There's some of the best times, aren't they? We don't let any of it distract us or dissuade us from dealing directly with Jesus. Now, this shows us another thing as well, that we expect to see heightened spiritual warfare, spiritual, I don't know, conflict, should we call it that? We expect to see a heightened sense of it when God is especially moving. You know, you want the Lord to move, don't you? But, but in the words of some people, that in any work revival, the second party to be revived is the devil. He gets busy when he sees more and more of his work threatened. So be aware of it. Be ready for it. But perhaps there's some of you, you've just begun to see God do something really wonderful really significant in your midst, and you're very happy about it. But you're totally unprepared for whatever kind of spiritual attack or opposition might come against it. Well, now's your call to be prepared for it. Now's your call to put your trust in Jesus, to draw very close to him. Because here's the good point about it, is that even though that there is a heightened sense of spiritual warfare in such seasons, we fully expect Jesus to win. Could it be any different? But, but it'll only be, it'll only be as we keep alive that deep, direct connection with Jesus himself. 
Now for the fourth point. The first one was their great dedication to the word of God. Uh, the second point was their, what was the second point? Help me out with this. Pardon me? Unusual miracles. And the third point was? That's right, spiritual warfare. Come on, I knew it. I'm just checking to make sure you guys did. The fourth point, look, this is very essential. This idea of renunciation. This whole incident with the sons of Siva, this whole incident with the sons of Siva awakened people to the reality of the spiritual realm and the spiritual battle, the conflict. So look at what happened in verse 17. And this is what I want to take pains. It, it seems that the environment of what happened in verse 17, that this happened among believers. Keep that in mind as we read it. Verse 17, this became known both to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Well, the sons of Siva incident certainly did become known. Verse 17 says that it became known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. That people realized that the spiritual world was for real, and that there was real power in the name of Jesus, that there was real power in the message and the gospel that Paul presented, and not in the empty rituals, whether they be Jewish rituals or pagan rituals. None of that had any power against the demonic realm or against any kind of spiritual opposition. And it made them fear the Lord. It made them, in a right sense, fear the power of the demonic realm. And as a result, verse 17, the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. There's no way that that's bad. When the name of the Lord Jesus is magnified, God is doing a great work. And in that stronghold of Satan, if you want to call it that, the city of Ephesus and all of its environment, God was launching out in a big way, laying down a marker saying, no, this is for real. And people responded. So much so, look at verse 18, so that many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. But before the sons of Seba incident, apparently many believers did not know that they were involved in the demonic. Maybe they saw their actions in a very innocent light. If you were to translate in the modern age, you know, they had a Ouija board and would play with it as a party game, but they didn't realize it had any spiritual connection or occultic weight to it. They had the deck of, uh, you know, fortune-telling cards or whatever they call them. And, and, you know, oh, yes, they laughed about it, but they didn't take it seriously. After the Sons of Siva incident, no, they repented. They wanted to get it right so that it says in verse 19, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. The Sons of Siva incident prompted Christians to renounce any remaining connections they had to the demonic. And they renounced these connections, first of all, by, by confessing them, and then by burning their magic books and amulets or, or objects, whatever they were, and disregarding whatever value that they had. Please notice what it says in verse 18. They came confessing and telling their deeds. This has been a hallmark of a true work of God in many men's knee instances. I, there's a little check inside of me that, that would say it's universal. Maybe it is universal. I don't know. If it's not, it's nearly universal. That when God moves, people confess their sins. Excuse me. People, people make notice of what they've done, and they confess their sins, and they get it right before God. No matter what the cost, and make no mistake about it, these books and scrolls full of magic charms, these amulets and incantations, they were very well known in Ephesus, and they were value. Uh, scholars that I've read put the value of what they did here at an estimated value of anywhere between $1 million and $5 million. That's how serious they were about getting things right with God. They were willing to renounce property and burn it in the value of one to five million dollars. I'll be honest with you, man. This idea, this picture here, it, it frightens me just a little bit because the idea of book burning frightens me. 
But what frightens me actually is the idea of governments burning books. The idea of believers voluntarily renouncing things that they should have nothing to do with and pushing them away from, well, that's a good thing, is it not? We don't want the government burning books. I don't want you burning my books. But what I do want is believers stirred by the Holy Spirit of God saying, this has no place in my life. This has no place among me. I renounce it. To me, this speaks of a lot of things, but one thing it speaks of is of the importance of renunciation. It's a very important question in the Christian life. And if I could put it directly, a question that really speaks to our age, your and mine, this age that we live in directly. And I think this applies to every man in this room, but I'll say especially it applies to a younger generation. What will you renounce for the glory of Jesus Christ? What pleasure, what um, gift, what uh, activity that may be perfectly honorable in the eyes of the world, it may be perfectly honorable in the eyes of some of your brothers and sisters, but for the glory of Jesus Christ, for the advancement of his kingdom, for your usefulness as a servant of God, you'll say, I'll renounce this. Now listen, I'm, I'm very careful. Matter of fact, I would say I'm even anxious to not make this a legalistic thing. We're not going to distribute a list. We're not going to click off specific things. But friends, it seems that following Jesus should lead us to renounce something. That being called to ministry, saying, I, I, I want to be recognized among God's people as some kind of leader, some kind of servant, shouldn't it make us willing to renounce something? And this attitude seems to be completely lost, even among pastors and leaders today. A willingness to renounce some things for the glory of God, for more effective service, and simply to set oneself apart for God. Instead, it seems we have a Christian world today that just is so anxious to yell out to the world, we're just like you. We can enjoy everything that you enjoy. We'll partake in everything that you partake in. Maybe we'll do it in a little more moderation, but we'll partake in it. But wouldn't the Holy Spirit stir your heart? And please, again, I have anxiety inside that anybody would regard this as a legalistic thing. No, any renunciation such as this in your life, it should be a thing of the Spirit of God. But if the Holy Spirit never tells you to renounce anything, What's that? Too often today, renunciation means I'm only going to eat organic. <laughs> Man, that's not renunciation. I'll get even more silly. For some men, pastors, they would say renunciation means, well, I'll, I'll, I'll only drink imported beers. That's not renunciation at all, pastor. And you know it. Look, I'm very anxious that this not be a thing of legalism. But you need to deal directly with the Spirit of God. And I pray that he would give you a quiet moment, perhaps in these very same days that we're together. Because you can't read the men of prior generations without getting a sense that they knew something about it that we don't know very well in our generation. You can't read those men of prior generations without getting a sense. They knew what it was to set oneself apart from God, not for legalism, not, not at the compulsion of any man, but rather out of a holy dedication to God and the pleasure, the surpassing pleasure of serving God. The, the indication you get from reading the men of the prior generations is that they were pleased to do this. This was not some great sacrifice. It was the best deal they ever had. I get to say no to this so that I can say yes to more of Jesus. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in their lives. All right? Don't miss the point of this. Verse 20, that's how it concluded. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Wouldn't you love that to be said above your congregation? Wouldn't you love that to be said above your community? The word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. All of it was worth it 
The, the, the work in Ephesus in the region of Roman Asia, it continued in a remarkable and blessed way. And those four things connected to it were very clear. There was a dedication to the word of God. There, there was the demonstration of God's power, sometimes in unusual ways. There was the reality of the spiritual battle. And there was a radical discipleship demonstrated by renunciation. Now, Take all of that and connect it just mentally. Again, I'm speaking to you as men who know the word. Connect it mentally to two other passages. First of all, connect all this glorious scene in Ephesus. Wouldn't you like to be a part of that Acts 19 church in Ephesus? I would. That would be one of the prime destinations of the time travel back in the book of Acts, to be a part of that. But connect that mentally to what Paul said to them in Acts chapter 20. Do you remember that? Where Paul said this, among other things, to these uh, leaders in the church at Ephesus, he met with them on the beach of Miletus, and what did he say to them? Among other things, he said this, I know that savage wolves will come in among you. And he also said this, I know that false teachers are going to arise from your own ranks. He said that actually to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. I can almost hardly believe it. He looked at those men. He goes, I know that from among you, you leaders of the church at Ephesus, whom I speak to you here on the beach at Miletus, I know that from among you, false teachers are going to arise. And what does this tell us? It tells us that as great as this work in Acts chapter 19 in the city of Ephesus and the whole region of Asia, as great as it was, it was not going to automatically last. It would not run on cruise control. Now, I think a very interesting debate to have, it's sort of a theoretical debate, but a very interesting debate or discussion to have is whether revival or these seeds of awakening or outpouring, whether they're designed to be perpetual or not. I think you can actually make an argument that God means to send them almost in pulses to equip, to train, to, to turn on, to empower a new generation. And a lot of people in this room are the result of prior works of God in the past, prior outpourings, and that's why we're here. You can debate that. But listen, the point is this. Even though the church of Ephesians uh, and Acts chapter 19 had a tremendous work Paul would not allow them to live on that reputation of the past. And he said, you got to guard yourselves and pay attention to the work of ministry that you have. Man, this is us. We need to press on to what God wants us to do today. As great as a work as Acts 19 was, Paul would not rest. In Acts chapter 20, he challenged him. That's the first scriptural connecting point. Here's the second one and my final one, my really final one. You can't forget, and many of you men, you've already made this connection. You're preaching this message right along with me. You've already made this connection. You've made this connection between the tremendous work in Ephesus in Acts 19, the warning in Acts chapter 20, and then what? The word of Jesus to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 where Jesus spoke to this same church at Ephesus, this church that saw one of the most remarkable outpourings, that, that, that had the Apostle Paul teach hundreds upon hundreds of hours and equip the saints for the work of ministry. Jesus spoke heavy words to them in Revelation 2. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the first works. You know that from verses 4 and 5 of Revelation chapter 2. I believe that there's a lot bound up in that idea, your first love. It's a love for Jesus. It's a love for his people. But it's also connected, I think, to what we saw originally in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. Think of what it was to have Ephesus at the beginning. First love, Ephesus loved God's word. First love, Ephesus saw God do real miracles. First love, Ephesus saw the reality of spiritual warfare. First love, Ephesus was willing to renounce anything that got in the way of their relationship with Jesus. 
So when Jesus calls them back to their first works, I think in some respect it's connected to that. Do you remember that great work that I did among you before? I want to do it again. I will do it again. But you got to repent. You got to come back to those first works, to that first love that you've left behind. Men, do you even want these things that mark a true awakening? I believe that you do. I believe that's why you're here. And I believe that that's just some of what God wants to build in you the next several days. So let's pray. And as we pray, I'm going to pray in just a moment, but I want to give it just a silent moment or two for the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart about something that I've said in the last minutes that, that might, well, just that the Holy Spirit would speak to your heart. So I'll just give it a few quiet moments and then I'll pray in conclusion. Jesus, we want you. We want you to glorify yourself. That your name would be glorified, magnified. Lord, we, we say it as we said before. <laughs> Rapture revival, Lord. Send it forth. But Lord, for you to send revival, for you to send awakening, All we say, Lord, is begin with us. Begin with me. We lay our hearts before you. And we pray that the work that you've begun even before this, uh, this time together began would continue to fulfill every good purpose that you have for our gathering together. And I pray especially, God, that you'd speak to men here about what you, what your spirit might have them renounce. Help us to understand, Lord, that even though others may, we, we are bound to be servants of, of our Father, sheep of our shepherd, guided by your Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your word and your presence among us. We pray this in Jesus' name.